So now this is a part two of our uh, topic on uh, uh, IRC one one two. That is uh, uh, the code for a concrete uh, and uh, distressed uh, concrete bridges. Uh, last uh, uh, Saturday we completed a part one. There uh, we covered the introduction, the basis of design, the material properties, and their design values. then the analysis and ultimate uh, limit state for linear element for the bending and the axial forces so that those topics we uh, could able to cover in the part 1 so in the part 2 today uh, there are many other chapters uh, like uh, so we, uh, ultimate uh, limit state of a shear punching shear torsion and induced deformation that is the section number 10 and 11 then the uh, service limit limit state section number uh, 12 there is there is a section or chapter on a pre stressing system that i will skip because uh, uh, madam will cover in her uh, lecture on a pre stressing systems later on then i will touch upon this durability section 14 and material quality and workmanship that is section number 18 and i will skip this detailing part which is a quite a descriptive Uh, so you all can go through the code and understand what are the provisions given in the code so that itself this four chapters are also quite a big chapter so i will try to cover as much as possible otherwise uh, anyway these handouts are being shared with you so you can go through the handouts also uh, uh, later on so let's start this uh, part number 2 uh, on the remaining chapters of this irc 112 so we'll start with this uh, high ultimate limit state for uh, shear and torsion so all of you know there are a various different type of a shear forces we encounter in the design of a structures so main the classification is the flexure shear the shear uh, appears due to the flex uh, bending in the member you know this um, shear and moments are complementary to each other whenever there is a shear uh, there is a associated effect is a bending moment or whenever there is a bending moment there is a shear of course not always but most of the time then uh, there is a shear in a flange portion of the flange beam uh, and a back box girder so that is in plane shear uh, in the flanges of the uh be more box girders so that is a different type of a shear then there are interface shear between the say old concrete or a new concrete in a composite uh superstructure then uh, this particular shear you know the punching shear which many times uh, applicable in case of a footings the uh, pile cap and uh, even the deck slab and then uh, there is a shear due to torsion effect on the uh, girders so we'll try to cover uh, as much as possible in a flexure shear there are uh, generally we deal with this particular shear in uh, uh, design uh, either we provide uh, uh, the shear reinforcement or uh, uh, we design the members without a shear reinforcement so the provision in irc 112 are slightly different when you deal with uh, this uh, members with and without shear reinforcement and all of you should know that we have to design the members for a shear only for the ultimate limit state okay uh, because uh, they don't uh, that way um, affect the serviceability uh, of the structure so we check uh, the shear only for the ultimate limit state and not for the sls so let's uh, now uh, see how to design the members with and without a shear reinforcement okay uh, so uh, generally uh, uh, when uh, the beam is loaded Uh, and uh, uh, it is uh, uh, in the load is increased uh, till it fails in a shear 
we get a different patterns of a uh, shear or there are a different zones which exhibited a uh, different uh, behavior in the shear so as you know this in the center uh, this particular uh, portion uh, the shear effects are less and the maximum or predominant effect is from the flexure so the cracks are mainly the vertical in a vertical direction okay then as you move towards the support from the both the side this vertical cracks how will start getting inclined okay so that is a basically a uh, the zone which is uh, having a combined flexure and a shear cracks and as you proceed further towards the support the web uh, there is a um, the distress due to shear and the effect of a bending is a very minimum in this particular portion and very near to support uh, there are a very uh, this the zone is almost uncracked so these are the different zones uh, for a different type of cracks in the uh, bending uh, member with a bending moments uh, the principle of a shear control in irc 112 is a uh, quite a or lot, there is a lot of difference between this particular a uh, method and generally what we use in a, our is 456 um in the 456 um generally we check what is the capacity of the concrete for resisting the applied shear uh, forces if the capacity of the uh, concrete uh, is uh, uh, not our capacity of that particular section is not adequate then we provide a reinforcement a shear reinforcement and that shear reinforcement is provided for that difference between the applied shear force and the capacity of the concrete okay but in case of irc 112 which is the best on the euro cores there we once uh, this capacity of the section or a, uh, of the concrete uh, is uh, uh, less than the applied shear force then the entire shear uh, force we provide a shear reinforcement neglecting the capacity of the concrete to resist the shear so that is a quite a major difference between these two approaches okay so until a certain shear force that is called v r d c c is for a concrete r is for a resistance d is for a design so the design resistance of a concrete for the shear uh is reached no calculated shear reinforcement is necessary that is for the um uh, when the capacity is uh, more than the applied shear force but we have to provide a minimum shear reinforcement uh, as you are in the code but when this uh, vrdc Uh, exceeds the applied design shear force then the shear reinforcement is necessary and that is for the full design shear force not for the difference between the capacity of the concrete and the applied shear for uh, shear uh, design shear force and then this shear reinforcement is to be calculated with variable inclination stress so he here we are uh, using the truss analogy method uh, for a design of a shear Uh, which you people, uh, all of you must have studied dur during your BTEC course. Uh, so there is a, a strut that is a compressive imaginary or a compressive member, and then there are uh, ties, uh, which is a the ten uh, carries the tension. So that compressive strut inclination, how uh, you can choose between the two extreme values. recommended that that theta the cot of theta should vary between a 1 to 2.5 so 1 means theta is equal to 45 and 2.5 means it is a 20, 21.5 degree so within that her uh, range how uh, you can vary the inclination of the strut we'll see what is the implication of this variation how to achieve the economy by varying this angle theta 
the shear reinforcement may not exceed the defined maximum value uh, to ensure the yielding of a shear reinforcement. So, uh, for the members with the shear reinforcement, we use the variable strut angle method. The advantage of this particular uh, vari uh, variable uh, truss, uh, variable angle truss analogy is uh, it gives a freedom to the designer. The low value of a theta leads to the low shear reinforcement and high value of a theta leads to the thin wave, saving the concrete. Okay, so it is a basically a um, recording stopped. Uh, uh, you can negotiate between the quantity of the steel and quantity of the concrete. The optimum choice depends on the type of a structure, what uh, kind Recording of in progress. What are the various uh, dimensions of that member. So it gives a quite uh, transparent uh, model. Uh, and uh, you can play with that particular uh, formulation in your design. So let's see how to use it. So when, see this is a part of the beam. Uh, very generalized. There is a support here. And uh, for a generalization, we have, uh, have an inclination at for the bottom, the soffit of the beam, as well as the top of the beam. And there is a pre-spacing tendon, and as well as a uh, 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 reinforcing uh, bars. So, and uh, these are the applied forces. That is the one is the actual force on the beam. Maybe because of the pre-stress or maybe because of the uh, applied loads. There is a uh, external shear acting on the face and there is a bending moment, um, uh, design bending moments. So these are the applied loads. And because of this virtue of this inclination of the top cord, which is in a compression, you get a vertically down component of this uh, force. So that will give a relief in a uh, your uh, or depend on a, what is the uh, angle that it can add the into the shear or it could be uh, give a relief. In this particular case, it will add to the shear, and then because of this uh, soffit, again there will be a vertical component because of this uh, inclination of the tie at the bottom, uh, tension member at the bottom. So the net design shear force, VNS, you call, is the uh, difference between the applied shear or design shear force minus the component of the this compressive cord, VCCD, and minus this comp vertical component of the uh, tensile, uh, uh, inclination of a tensile cord. So when you correct this to these two effects, you get a net design shear force. Similarly, we have to take uh, account of this inclination of the pre-stressing uh, steel, uh, which is this particular component, P is due for the pre-stressing, this for the design. So the uh, shear due to the external force VE, uh, the actual uh, uh, the, the net design shear force is a difference is a, uh, between the design uh, external shear force minus shear due to uh, 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 this uh, external forces minus the shear component of the pre-stressing tendon, whether it is a bounded or unbounded. And as I told you, that is a co component of the compressive and the tensile uh, time member. Uh, this uh, VPD is the shear component of the pre-stressing tendon. So it, this particular uh, component includes the vertical component of the pre-stressing force after all losses, vertical component of the increase in a pre-stressing force in case of a ULS design with a crack condition. The pre-stressing force of the fully capacity of the cable can be taken for such purposes provided the corresponding strain can be achieved. So have you understood what is this? See, during, during pre-stressing, because of the profile of the cable, you will get certain component. 
when you start the loading the beam uh, externally uh, because of the say dead load superimposed live uh, dead load or a live load because of the deformation uh, or a deflection of the beam uh, there will be a de um, the uh, 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 deformation in the further deformation in the pistracing cable so because of that further deformation uh, the force in the cables goes slightly up so whatever that increase in the force in the cable so uh, that component due to that increase uh, that also you can consider in the resistance of the um, uh, shear and then there will be a shear due to hyperstatic or secondary effect of the cable if it is a indeterminate structure like i say a uh, continuous uh, girder or um, it is a pre stressed uh, um, concrete um, uh, portal nowadays many places you might have seen in the cities that for the uh, flyovers and uh, uh, metro viaduct how uh, we provide of um, this portal frames and if the spans are quite large then you have to prestress the even the portal frames also so portal being a indeterminate structure there are lot many hyperstatic or secondary effects and uh, whatever shear is due to this hyperstatic effect that also we have to consider whether it is giving a relief or adding into the your uh, actual shear force so that effect you have to consider in the design so first we will consider this uh, um, the member without a shear reinforcement so all of you uh, might have noticed that when you we design a slabs or uh, whether it is in a building or uh, in the bridge or even in a say pile caps how uh, we don't provide a shear reinforcement uh, basically there are a uh, main uh, main uh, reinforcement at the bottom or at the top but we very rarely provide the vertical reinforcement ah uh, in those uh, members concrete members so how do this shear then gets resisted so that is resisted by you know these three actions one is the dowel actions in the main bar so this is the free body diagram of a uh, part of the beam uh, on the left side and there is a part of the beam on the right side which is uh, i have removed for the simplicity so these three components give the resistance to the uh, shear when there is a no shear reinforcement one is the dowel action second is the aggregate interlock across this um, surface and there is the um, the compression ha uh, in the concrete because of this um uh, moment divided by z effect okay so that gives us the resistance to the shear because of this uh, 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 compression so three through this ha uh, the shear gets resisted without a shear reinforcement so this uh, uh, this is a basically a beam action and some of the force which is near to the support gets transferred directly to the support through the arch action okay so the shear gets resisted in this by the two actions one is a beam action and other is a arch action and it depends on a, where is the load how far it is from the support so that is the depends on a, this particular ratio the our uh, distance a with respect to the d and if it is a much more near to the support more it will transfer the load directly as a strut or a, as a uh, arch action so there will be reduction which is called beta depends on this particular ratio and these are the Uh, steps or a flow chart given uh, for the design of the member without a shear reinforcement so the code allows to take a relief of a certain uh, actions and code doesn't allow to take a relief for example the relief due to the increase of pre stress if that particular slab is a pre stressed uh, slab then whatever that i explained you the increase in a pre stress due to in the ulf condition that code doesn't allow to consider when the member is not having a uh, is not having a shear reinforcement and again the relief due to the inclined uh, cord that is a whether it is a compression or a tension that also code doesn't allow to take uh, uh, the relief uh, of the same 
but the other things ha huh, uh, it is uh, allowing to consider as a relief then based on that uh, distance from the support ha uh, this uh, we have to check uh, this um, uh, the compression in the strut so that uh, the design uh, shear force should be less than 50% of the web thickness into depth into this uh, mu, mu and uh, the design uh, compressive permissible stress in the concrete so this uh, shear strength of this with, uh, member without a shear reinforcement are uh, depends on a longitudinal reinforcement ratio that is the rho l uh, the tensile strength of the concrete which is a proportional to the uh, fck then the depth of the member and the axial stress of the member as the axial stress uh, maybe due, due to the stress goes up uh, you get a more shear resistance so this is a flow chart uh, given uh, we have to see uh, what is the vr cd uh, with respect to uh, if it is a say stress there is a axial force uh sigma cp maybe because of the stress so that 15% of that axial stress and uh, the uh, amount of this uh, tensile reinforcement so with that particular uh, uh, parameters you can work out this uh, re uh, re uh, design the resistance of the shear for uh, of that concrete section and uh it should be again limited to this particular value the other parameters are same only this v minimum which is a 0 0.31 0 0.031 k raised to uh, 3 by 2 fck root of fck so this is the one upper limit given in the code though it may be satisfying this particular requirement this vrc uh, dc should not exceed this amount okay so we have to work out the vr uh, dc and compare with the uh, you are applied um, shear force and uh, there is a you can vary that uh, or this vr dc uh, if the concrete grade is more than 60 then you can restrict that vr dc up to m60 if if you suppose your grade of a concrete is m70 or 80 you can't take that uh, additional uh, uh, resistance now if this uh, vr dc is uh, greater than uh, applied load then we have to provide a minimum shear reinforcement in case of a beam uh, in case of a slab uh, uh, you don't have to provide any shear reinforcement and code gives see there are methods uh, called the effective weights method uh, for a design of a deck slab uh, given in the annexure so if you are using that uh, method then uh, you even don't have to check uh, the flexural shears uh, in the slab because in that particular slab how uh, the most of the shear uh, you get a uh, arch action in the slab so because of that particular reason the code allows to omit this uh, shear check calculation in the uh, design but if this rc that uh, resistance of the concrete without a shear reinforcement is a less than the applied shear force then you have to go with the shear reinforcement you have to provide a shear reinforcement so now move towards this uh, the next topic that is a shear design without a with a shear reinforcement so there are a direct support there is a indirect support indirect support means this is the main beam and this is a secondary beam so there is no direct support below so that is called indirect support here there is a direct support below the beam okay so the stress field is uh, something like a fan and here the stress field is uh, almost like a um, uh, equally distributed in a uh, uh, with a parallel uh, struts so here we have to do a uh, check at a d effective from the support but here in this particular case you have to check the shear at the face of the 
indirect support. Okay, so uh, why is it like that? Because here, here in this case, most of the uh, the shear in this particular zone goes to the support directly as a uh, strut or a, a arch action. But here that is not possible because their support is a continuous over a phase. Okay, so uh, this arch action will not happen in this particular case and hence we have to check the shear at a phase of this beam. So these are the, uh, the same example of the direct and indirect support. Again, uh, there is another case of an indirect support. Suppose if the load is now applied uh, below the beam. Okay. So we, you have to check uh, the stress uh, shear check at that particular location only. There is no question of uh, checking the shear at a defective. Um, so there is a, uh, when there is a direct support, uh, you have to check. Uh, we uh, at a D effective, the shear reinforcement is calculated at a D, has to be extended till the support. So whatever the shear reinforcement we, you get at a D effective, the same shear reinforcement you have to continue till the your support. The checking capacity of the compression compression strut against the crushing net shear force acting at the face of the support shall be taken. The additional longitudinal tension reinforcement. Uh, is required to cater the horizontal component of the compression uh, strut apart from the bending requirement. So what is that? Generally, you provide uh, the main bent tensile still at the bottom. You calculate from the bending moment. Okay. And with uh, curtailment, you provide uh, um, uh, with a L uh, uh, with a lap length to certain distance. But because of this particular uh, truss analogy, uh, I will show you in, uh, in the next slide, uh, there will be an additional uh, tension in the uh, this tension cord because of this angle and that particular co uh, component. So that additional tension we have to consider while working out this tensile reinforcement in this particular zone. Uh, so these are the, uh, the in case of a uh, indirect support, the fan shaped compression field does not exist. It is all are parallel. The shear at the face shall be taken for the calculating the shear reinforcement as well as the capacity checking the capacity of the strut against the crushing. The common intersection of the support beam and the supporting beam requirement suspension uh, reinforcement in addition to the support reinforcement. If there is a suspend, the, the load is suspended, so that uh, 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 force how uh, you have to take transfer to the beam using the additional reinforcement, and that will be more uh, more and above this uh, shear reinforcement we provide in the beam. So these are the uh, basically the what is allowed and what is not allowed uh, the relief in the members with the shear reinforcement. So generally most of the things are allowed except the relief of the reduction reduction of the external shear due to the concentrated load within the 2D from the edge of the support cannot be taken into account of uh, while checking this uh, strength of the compressive strut. So that is. Uh, not permitted by the code. So, uh, uh, again, uh, one minute. Uh, so, we have to check whether uh, there is a cracking or, un, uh, or, or whether the member is a cracked or uncracked. So, code has given this particular uh, criteria. Uh, this is a basically a simple our uh, principal stress formula. Uh, when you, uh, this is the uh, basically the direct stresses due to the pre stressing and due to the bending. And this is the shear force at that particular section. So, this 
if it is a, exceeds the the tensile capacity of the concrete design tensile capacity of the concrete then the you can say that the section is a crack section okay and then uh, you have to um, uh, basically uh, uh, see whether uh, what is the uh this uh, vrcd which is, if you just rearrange these numbers uh, you will get this particular formula so the capacity of the concrete in a shear is a basically the function of all these values uh, which is the tensiles uh, design tensile strength of the concrete this is the pre stressing uh, stress this is the bending stress and this is again the uh, same thing so uh, with that you will get the this capacity of the concrete so at a centroid the bending moment will be the stress due to the bending moment will be zero and the form formula will get simplified in this particular fashion so this gives you the capacity of the concrete uh, design capacity of the concrete uh, resistance uh, capacity now if that particular resisting design capacity exceeds the external load Uh, or it is more than the uh, applied load, then the only minimum shear reinforcement is required, and that value is specified in the uh, code in this particular equation, ten point twenty and sixteen point four. Okay, but if it is the capacity of the concrete is less than the applied uh, shear force, then uh, and um, the section is found to be uncracked. Okay, then the shear reinforcement is required to be calculated without considering the any shear resistance from the concrete, as we discussed last time. So there is a no need to check the capacity uh, at an angle forty-five. Uh, uh, And these are the particular the stress analogy model. Uh, this is a. with a inclined shear reinforce uh, shear reinforcement and this is a with a vertical shear reinforcement so this is the red lines are a uh, uh, still uh, provided in the inclined fashion and this gray lines are basically the compressive struts or compression uh, uh, due to the shear so with this truss how huh, the your top cord is in a compression and uh, bottom cord is in a tension and so this is the compression is the fcd the tension is the ftd and this is a lever arm z between the two the same thing is a uh, with a uh, vertical reinforcement here the angle uh, with respect to the horizontal of a tensile of the shear reinforcement is alpha and uh, this compressive cord is a theta in case of a vertical obviously this alpha will be a 90 degree and theta is whatever the theta you choose uh, for your design okay so these are the two more two models for the truss analogy so uh, how to finalize how to decide uh, the uh, uh, this particular model so first we have to Uh, find out what is the lever arm. Generally, for reinforced concrete members, we take is a ninety percent. Uh, for other section, the actual value derived from the flexural analysis. For a pre-stressed concrete, it is the distance between the CG of the compressive force somewhere here, and the force of the CG of the tensile force. So that gives you the lever arm. Said okay. then you have to decide the angle of the uh, the shear reinforcement you can provide anything in between the 45 to 90 generally we go with the 90 because of the uh, the simplicity in the design as well as the simplicity in the during the construction and then the main point is how the decision about this angle theta which is the um, angle theta which, which is the basically the uh the uh, angle between the compression cord and the horizontal uh, axis of the member so as i told you last time the code permits between these two limits 1 and 2.5 uh, which is nothing but the theta between the 45 degree to 21.8 degrees 
So that is called the variable plus angle method. So you can choose your uh, uh, the configuration of a truss so that you will get a, the least quantities of a concrete and uh, reinforcement. So these are the uh, basically the uh, the derivation of uh, how you will get this VRDS. S is for a steel uh, resistance resisting design cap shear capacity for a reinforcing steel. Okay, so that formula you can uh, go through this derivation and uh, see how it has been derived. Okay. Uh, which is given in the code as a equation 10.11 for the this is for the vertical uh, this is for the inclined uh, reinforcement with the inclination alpha if it, and for the vertical stirrups uh, the formula gets simplified in this particular fashion so this is the area of the shear reinforcement this is the yield of that uh, yield stress of the shear reinforcement this is the spacing this is the z is the lever arm and the alpha and theta, you know, the angle of a stud and the reinforcement. So you work out for a given uh, area and spacing and inclination, what is its capacity to resist or uh, uh, carry the shear force. So that was for a steel. Now for the concrete, see uh, when uh, in the this particular stress analogy, whatever the force in this strut, because of that force, the strut should not get crushed. Okay, so that stress, the compressive stress in the strut, we have to check. Apart from this, shear reinforcement. Otherwise, uh, imagine you have got a very thin uh, web for the beam or for the uh, boss girder. Uh, though your shear reinforcement is adequate, there is a possibility of a, having a cracks, the compressive cracks uh, in this strut of that very thin waves. So code gives the, uh, the limitation of that particular uh, value of the um, uh, 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 concrete. Just a minute, huh? I will. Uh, Hmm? Okay, okay. Uh, so this, uh, the allowed uh, compressive stress uh, in a diagonal strut is given by this formula. And this uh, uh, FCD is uh, basically the alpha CC into FCK divided by gamma M. And uh, uh, this alpha uh, CW equal to 1 if there is a zero axial force. If the axial force, it may be due to the pre-stress, mainly due to the pre-stress. If it is a very from a 0 to 25% uh, uh, of FCD, then this alpha is uh, given in this particular way. And uh, so for various range of uh, axial compression, uh, code has suggested different values of uh, alpha, which is ranging from 1 to uh, 1.25. Okay, so from that you can work out what is the allowable stress in the concrete for, the, for this compressive strut. And uh, this uh, mu uh, is a basically a 6, 0.6 into 1 upon FCK divided by 310. FCK is a basically a, our cube strength of the concrete. Uh, in Euro code, uh, this value, if you see the Euro code, it is given as a 250. Okay and which you have changed it to 310. So what could be the reason? The reason is basically we use a cube strength and the Euro code use a cylindrical strength. And the cube, uh, the cylindrical strength is always 80%, approximately 80% of the cube strength. So to that, it has been modified from a 250 to 310. So many places when there is a such correlations are there, uh, uh, here in IRC 112, who have made those correction, uh, changes, modifications to suit uh, for our um, the practice of uh, testing the cube. 
Okay. So uh, this uh, uh, for the inclined shear reinforcement, uh, this VRD max is given by this particular formula as we have seen, and for the vertical, the, this is the uh, equation. Now with the vertical uh, shear reinforcement, uh, we will see what is the how this choosing the theta value will affect our design. So you know this uh, maximum shear force uh, for the uh, using the steel reinforcement uh, uh, or uh, shear reinforcement is uh, given by this equation. If you vary the theta between say 45 to 21.8, um, uh, that is the uh, uh, angle of inclined compression strut, uh, with the theta is equal to 45, VRD max what we get is this. Okay. Uh, from this particular equation. Because uh, cot theta is equal to 1, tan theta is equal to 1, 1 plus 1, it will be 2. So you get a 2 here. When it is a 21.8, uh, this denominator you will, uh, you will get as a 2.9. Now you can uh, see this, uh, the resistance, when it is a 45 degree, uh, it is a maximum. Okay, it is almost uh, uh, divided by 2 and here it is a divided by say 3. So you get enhancement of a resisting uh, um, uh, um, uh, the strut value, uh, compression strut by almost 50% when the theta is a shallow. Okay. So you, you can save a concrete, you can reduce the thickness of the wave uh, if you use a flatter theta. Okay, but what is the refurcation? If you keep on the, uh, making the angle flatter from 45 to 21.8, though you can reduce the thickness of the wave, uh, your reinforcement will start going up. So now you know what is the formula for the shear reinforcement. It is a, with respect to cot theta. So when theta is equal to 45, you will get a cot theta is equal to 1. But when the theta is equal to 21.8, uh, you get this as a 2.5. So when theta is equal to the angle of a strut equal to 45, more uh, stiffer, uh, you will get uh, the resistance is uh, less. Okay. Uh, but uh, uh, here with the 21.8, uh, you get a two and a half times of a resistance. So 150% increase uh, with the theta is equal to 21.8. Uh, uh, here it was uh, different. Here when you um, uh, increase the um, this one angle, uh, you get a more resistance. Okay. That is one and a half times, uh, uh, or say forty-five percent percent increase in the strength. So that is a basically the uh, um, uh, what you can say uh, uh, the we have to balance it between this concrete uh, quantity of the concrete and quantity of the steel by changing this angle. Um, so uh, the best, uh, so this is the, these are the various formulas we have seen. Based on the shear force VD, the first satisfy the requirement that the crushing of the concrete of the inclined strut does not occur by choosing uh, the uh, theta. And that is the VRD maximum is a greater than VD. And then taking the same angle of a strut and calculate the shear reinforcement with that particular angle of a strut, that is a theta. Okay. Um, so when there is a uh, support, the load is acting uh, near to the support, you can uh, take advantage of that reduction factor beta in the viewer calculation due to this uh, arch action. 
And as I told you last time that uh, additional tensile force in the longitudinal direction uh, reinforcement due to the shear, um, uh, with whatever that particular uh, uh, the tension is there or the uh, compression in the strut, that much additional force will be there in this bottom uh, tie member. So this uh, additional force in the ten, uh, tensile tie will be basically half of the vertical force into uh, cot theta minus cot of alpha. Okay. So that force you have to add in your regular flexural uh, tension in the reinforcement, which is a uh, m moment by z, m by z. And for that, you have to uh, provide this uh, additional reinforcement. So that is basically this uh, shift rule. Uh, what uh, the code has given. Uh, this is the that uh, curve uh, C uh, is a resisting bending moment. This is the curve uh, A is a envelope of uh, the bending stress as well as uh, whatever the announcement uh, is there because of that. Uh, 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 this is the basically the from the design and whatever that additional uh, uh, tensile force is there in the reinforcement, uh, which is that uh, shift. And above that, you have to, uh, so whatever the uh, tensile reinforcement you have to provide, that should envelop the total requirement of that, uh, the original tension from the flexure plus this uh, additional tension due to the shear force. Okay, and this is the basically the, the the lab what we are going to provide uh, from uh, that uh, curtailment point. If that shift would not have been there, then you, the lab could have been that curtailment could have been slightly earlier. So that you have to keep it in uh, mind while detailing the reinforcement for the beam. What is the time? It is already one hour. Okay, so I will move a bit fast. Uh, this is again the, uh, okay. The, so now this is a flow chart for the design of a shear for the RCC beam. Uh, what we have discussed earlier is for the pre-stressed uh, beam. So if you remove the pre-stress, you will get the design rules for the uh, reinforced concrete uh, beams. So I will not go through this again. You can defer the handouts. Uh, when there is a pre-stress, again, uh, you have to uh, see how you can uh, go ahead uh, uh, and uh, uh, define your designs. This is uh, again, uh, uh, because of the pre-stress, uh, what is the effect on a shear resistance? First, you get a compressive force due to which uh, you will get an announcement in the shear resistance which is again given in this particular uh, uh, curve. So as your pre-stress goes up, say, uh, uh, so that enhances your alpha and gives you the uh, uh, more uh, uh, crushing uh, capacity of the wave. Then in a pre-stress concrete, since you are, you are providing the duct in the wave, you have to deduct the duct while calculating the capacity of the uh, uh, wave. So whenever uh, you have to multiply it by this uh, uh, width and the uh, height of the wave, so this duct you have to reduce, uh, deduct uh, from the total width of the duct. So the code has given the uh, various uh, stipulation uh, depending on the what type of a duct you are using, whether it is a metallic duct or a plastic that is HDP duct, whether the ducts are grouted or ungrouted, or what is the diameter of the duct. It is a small, then there is a rules are different. If the duct is bigger, then the rules are different. So this was about the shear design. Huh? Uh, our normal lecture shear design for this uh, pre-stressed as well as the RCC beam with and without a shear reinforcement. Um, um, see, you can go through the code huh, and uh, there are some solved examples also there in the handbook. So once you solve one or two examples, the ideas will be more clear. 
Okay, it is a bit complicated than our uh, provisions given in the IR uh, IS four five six. But once you do one or two designs, the things are more simpler. So after that, we'll go to the interface shear. So what is the interface shear? As I told you, when you are casting the two uh, concrete, uh, the member in a, at the two different stages, ah, uh, then there is a uh, the phenomenon called interface shear. Okay. Hello. Yes. Hello. 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 Dr. Sahib, can you please mute? Vashila, Vashila, Dwar, Dwar, Dwar. He can't have more. No, no, me, 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 he got it, but I got it. Rui, can you just put him, Dr. Sahib, on mute, please? Online, I'm getting the institute here in meeting, Rui. Rui. Meeting, I'll put it on. Hmm. Okay, so, uh, when you uh, uh, cast the concrete at a different time, say for example in a composite uh, bridge, then you have eye girders and then casting a slab over that at a some time later, uh, then this particular interface shear uh, uh, occurs and that resistance is a basically view of a sigma n, which is a, uh, the normal or a perpendicular force, the and the uh, the shear uh, that um, um, the studs you are or a shear reinforcement you provide between the the uh, the two concretes, okay, and this mu uh, varies point from point five to point seven depending on the what is the how is the surface between the two concrete. Uh, it can be very smooth. It could be a uh, uh, normal. No, it is just a smooth, and if it is rough, it is then uh, it is a point. Uh, Seven, and this is the uh, uh, this um, uh, the ratio between the area of a uh, steel and area of a uh, uh, one meter. Uh, the this one and the uh, alpha is the this alpha is the basically the angle of reinforcement uh, to the interface surface. So when you are casting the concrete at two different uh, stages, this red line is basically the interface between the two um, uh, concrete. Uh, and then you can find out what is the resistance and see with the, your uh, interface here if it is a... And accordingly you have to design this, um, uh, the reinforcement. Okay. If they are in, uh, in, uh, indented uh, surface, then again you can have a more uh, view value, which is about a point eight. With that, we'll now go to the torsion. Uh, there are two types of torsions. One is the equilibrium torsion, and the other is the compatibility torsion. Equilibrium torsion means there is a, uh, it is a deterministic uh, or determin uh, determinate uh, uh, member. Uh, it uh, um, uh, th this requires the basic static equilibrium of the structure and uh, here you have to design the uh, member for the torsional moment. You can't escape. But in case of a compatibility torsion, uh, which occurs due to the coexistence of a members which are uh, compatible to each other. For example, there is a main beam and the other beam is just resting on this particular beam. And because of the loading acting on the beam, there is a torsion in the beam, this particular beam. Because it rotates at that particular uh, uh, point. So, uh, even if you say on design this beam for the torsion, it will just crack and the, there will be a redistribution of a bending moments within this uh, grid and it will get stabilized. Okay. Um, so, uh, if you don't provide uh, the design uh, uh, for the torsion, there is an alternative uh, load path. The structure may not become unstable, but it will twist and results the deformation and the cracking. Okay. And these uh, are the rules which are similar to what we do it in our IR, uh, IS uh, 456. So we'll not, I will not go into the details. Basically, you have to um, have a different uh, uh, 
uh, neighbors and uh, then uh, accordingly again you can act uh, consider this as a one beam and whatever the shear due to torsion is there you can use the same rules for the shear and design that particular portion of the uh, curved uh, that's the particular element uh, it could be a wave or soffit or top slab of the uh, say boss girder um it could be a curved boss girder or it could be a torsional effect on the straight boss girder because of the eccentricity of the uh, applied loads so again i will skip uh, these uh, things which is our regular uh, design methods uh, which we use even for the buildings so again same means so whatever that waves are there uh, you have to Uh, add this torsion, whatever the shear force due to torsion in your regular uh, shear force due to the applied load, and carry out the same method, uh, same procedure with varying the angle theta uh, for both combined uh, shear as well as the torsion. And then you can find out this uh, reinforcement. so when there is a uh, torsion plus uh, uh, external shear you can add these two effects and can get this particular uh, uh, net effect that is the increase of a shear force in a one wave and decrease in a shear in another wave so for a hollow section uh, you can work out the transfer transformation corresponding to the total shear that is out of uh, torsion plus vertical is the same as the vertical shear force for a solid section uh, work out the uh, transfer uh, shear reinforcement separately for a torsional shear and vertical shear and provide the same in the region where it should be and because of torsion there will be a additional longitudinal reinforcement is required Uh, because of that uh, three-dimensional cross effect, so that also you have to provide in your uh, the in the in the longitudinal reinforcement. So this is a uh, basically the design for the shear and torsion, and. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, uh okay with the co compression and co tension cord how uh, we have to add the uh, reinforcement for the flexion and direct uh, together so all these slides i have taken it from the earlier presentation given by mr alok bombik so just acknowledge his uh, uh work and with that now we'll move to uh, the next uh, section which is service rate limit state that uh, i will try to complete in next 20 minutes because another two chapters are there durability and uh, uh, the quality control so as you know that uh, what we seen in the last lecture that uh, the service rate check for the service rate includes the stress check in the concrete as well as steel the crack width in the concrete and the deflection this uh, uh, this uh, we have to find out the tensile stress in the concrete to decide whether the section is a cracked or uncracked so if the tensile stress in the concrete in extreme fiber exceeds this uh, either uh, this mean tensile strength of the concrete or flexural mean flexural tensile strength of the uh, concrete then you can cons uh, consider that section as a cracked section This is the, the formula for the flexural uh, uh, tensile which, uh, stress maximum of uh, these, these two uh, parameters. Uh, then uh, we have to check uh, this compressive stress in the concrete. This is uh, and that check we have to do only for the rare combination. Okay. So during the rare combination, 
the maximum compressive stress in the concrete should not exceed 48% of the uh, FCK. That is mainly because after 0.48 uh, FCK, uh, there is a uh, whatever the strength gets developed, uh, they are um, almost irreversible. So, and the whatever the cracking happens, uh, it is uh, difficult to uh, close those cracks again. So that is the that for that we have to do carry out this particular check. Similarly, uh, if during the quasi-permanent load combination, if your compressive stress uh, exceeds the uh, 36% of a FCK, then you have to go with a nonlinear creep. Um, otherwise, the creep, the creep effect, what we consider, you can consider as a linear, as given in the uh, uh, this chapter six of the uh, code. But if it exceeds, the code doesn't say that it cannot exceed for a quasi-permanent load combination. But if you find it exceeds, then whatever the uh, creep calculations you do, uh, you have to consider the nonlinear uh, equation uh, uh, behavior in the creep. And those uh, equations are given in a, um, uh, that uh, uh, section 12.2.1, uh, point number two. So the main thing is we have to restrict the compressive stress in the rare combination at a point uh, 40 times of FCK. Uh, then the, there is a restriction on a uh, tensile stress uh, in the steel. So for again uh, for rare combination, the code has restricted to the 80% of the yield strength of, uh, strength of the uh, steel. And there is another check which used to be there in an earlier version that uh, two uh, avoid the check for the fatigue or verification of the fatigue, you have to restrict uh, the uh, stress in the reinforcement uh, equal to 300 MPa for a frequent load combination. Okay, and uh, now uh, recently in a month, about six months back, we have introduced that uh, annexure A8 for a verification of the fatigue. So now there are detailed guidelines is a given. If you want to go for a more stress in the reinforcement for achieving the economy, say for example, um, uh, 350 MPA or 400 MPA, then you have to carry out that fatigue check and prove that uh, the section is safe for a uh, fatigue check. Okay. But those calculations are a little bit cumbersome. If you want to avoid those calculations, you can restrict your stress in the reinforcement uh, to the 300 MPA. Then the, there are restrictions on stressing of stressing which you have seen uh, in the last lecture, which is not actually a part of the service rate limit state. Uh, but since the, uh, there is a limitation on stresses, uh, I included this slide here again. And uh, for a precious concrete uh, members, if there are no tensile stresses in X2 fiber, for the frequent load combination, again, no fatigue check is necessary to carry out. So, the, uh, so what we have seen, there are limits on a stress uh, values of a concrete and a reinforcement. So now for the cracking, there are a, uh, code has specified certain crack words. So crack can be formed uh, due to the load effects as well as the internal deformation like a creep, shrinkage, temperature. Uh, even for the partially twisted structure, which is now the code is allowing, we have to check for the crack width. And then uh, uh, we have to check for the limit state of the fatigue. Though the fatigue is actually a, you can consider as a different limit state altogether, but many codes internationally, they uh, club this fatigue as a part of an ultimate limit state and not a serviceability limit state. Somehow in our code, it has come in a service rail limit state, which is not actually the right uh, location. Then the, apart from the crack width, what code says for a precious concrete member, uh, uh, for a certain load combination, there should not be the tensile stress uh, within this 100 millimeter around the duct. 
So that they call as a decomposition limit state. Limit state means the uh, the region of a three uh, within the three uh, within within a hundred mm uh, should not get decompressed. There has to be a always some compression should be there. Okay, that is to basically protect the displacing spill from uh, any ingress no, of the. Uh, uh um uh, say chloride or uh, other deteriorating material <clears throat> the members with uh, bonded or uh, uh or bonded plus unbonded tin the combination of bonded and unbonded cable the requirement of the plistress concrete applies but if all the tenders are unbonded then the uh, requirement of the reinforce, reinforcement is uh, is applied that is the same as the our reinforcing steel so what are those requirements the code has recommended certain crack widths uh, uh, for a different exposure class uh, classes this exposure classes we will see in the chapter number uh, or section number 14 so uh, if the uh, you have a reinforced concrete members or The pre-stress member with the unbonded tendons for quasi permanent load combination. These are the um, specified the crack widths. For extreme, it is a 0.2, and for other uh, exposure clauses, classes, um, it is a 0.3. For a pre-stress concrete with a bonded tendon, for a frequent load combination, for a moderate it is a 0.2. Uh, uh, for severe again, it is a 0.3, and um, For severe and extreme, uh, it is uh, uh, for a hundred millimeter around the pre-stress index. It is a decompression, and all other areas it is a point two. Okay, so uh, as I told you last time, uh, now the uh, this particular code allows the cracking of a pre-stress concrete member. This earlier the um, uh, the requirement used to have a full uh, pre-stress. Uh, members now uh, it is uh, the partial pre-stress concrete members are also allowed so these are the requirements for the crack widths then uh, there is a uh, minimum reinforcement from the crack control okay so this is the minimum reinforcement this is the stress in the steel and uh, these are the basically the area if, uh, uh, effective um as a stress effective and various uh, uh, constants so that definition of the, uh, uh, the uh, this uh, area of a concrete tension etc is uh, given in the code so you can go through this various uh, nomenclatures so okay, i'm just skipping i'm just moving ahead hmm, this is a uh, basically the uh, um the division of the flanged cross section areas for the analysis of the cracking and uh, this is a uh, formula for working out this crack width the crack width is a basically the multiplication of the uh, the crack spacing and the difference of the strain okay um this um, the spacing uh, you can the, again the formulas are given to work out the spacing uh say for example this is the cross section of the beam and this is the uh, the reinforcement and this is the spacing of the reinforcement so if you uh, mm, uh, so, uh apply the tension on this particular uh, member um this is a uh, uh basically uh the spacing of the uh, the crack width okay the this is a this is a neutral axis this is a concrete tension surface uh see the crack spacing predicted by the formula so as you move from the reinforcement the crack spacing increases okay and uh, or the crack width increases so near on the reinforcement Hmm, the crack width is uh, uh, less, okay. And this is a uh, basically the 
the the difference between the strain values uh which is the the elastic strain minus the whatever the other effects are there so that is been deducted from this uh, uh tensile uh, stress in the concrete divided by this e value but this particular difference should not exceed the 60% of the tensile stress in the concrete divided by e value of the concrete so from you can get the difference in the strain and once you multiply it with the uh the crack spacing uh, you will get the crack width so this is the effective tension area uh, uh the definition of effective tension area for calculating the crack width and in case there is a spacing of the reinforcement is a uh, uh, less less than say five times of the clear cover plus half the diameter and uh, then you can directly work out the what should be the uh, the maximum spacing and um, this uh, ratio and if the larger spacing if the spacing is more than this five times of a cover plus half the diameter then you can work out directly with this particular equation and then uh, there is a uh, uh, provision in the code uh, that is a dim to satisfy rule once you satisfy that particular requirement you did not have to carry out the uh, this calculations uh, you can uh, skip the calculations follow this particular descriptive uh things given in the code and that particular uh, tables i will see uh, there are two stipulation one is the you can have a maximum bar diameter for the crack control or you can have a maximum bar spacing for a crack control so uh, and this particular um, the stipulations are given with respect to cover of a uh, 40 mm uh this um, the test, uh, uh, tensile stress in a concrete 2.8 uh this um, uh, height of the, uh, the this one is a 0.5 uh etc with this particular constants uh so either of this two either you can go with a uh, bar uh, max, uh, maximum bar diameter or maximum spacing how uh, to satisfy this crack width so if you are wanted to have a say crack width of 0.3 mm then uh, you can have a maximum diameter of a 32 mm with a stress limit of a 160 but if you want to uh, reduce the bar diameter uh, say for example 12 then uh, uh, then the stress you, you can increase the stress and reduce the bar diameter for the same time for the crack width of 0.2 mm for the same stress how uh, the restriction of the bar diameter is a 25 so as you go uh, higher and higher stresses the bar diameter is are restricted okay so either you can use this particular uh, the specifications or uh, you can choose the uh, maximum bar spacing uh, for crack width of a 0.3 um uh, uh you can uh, if your stress uh, in the, the steel because of that other calculation of the flexor etc is a 160 then you can have a more uh, spacing of the bars say 300 but if your stress uh, is more say 320 then the spacing of the uh, reinforcement shall be as less as a 100 and these are the values for the 0.2 mm uh, crack width okay so it is uh, the uh, as the stress increases the spacing reduces so these are the limit sets of the deflection uh, all of you know it uh, affects the appearance adversely uh, then to mitigate this uh, deflection uh, the pre camber is uh, cambering is permitted you can cast in a the reverse cambering uh, um the geometry when the load comes ha uh, it will um basically straighten that girder and this uh, deflection limits are applied only for the moving load not for the dead load dead load and sidl you can go with a pre cambering 
Okay, and uh, the special bridges like Cable State are not covered, and the uh, code is asking to refer a uh, uh, special literature. And these are the deflection limits given in the code for the vehicular live load is spanned by 800. For a pedestrian live load with or without vehicle, it is spanned by 1000. For a vehicular live load on a country river, it is spanned by 300. For a pedestrian with or without vehicle, it is spanned by 375. So basically, uh, this uh, for a pedestrian, the uh, stipulations are more stringent. That is because uh, indirectly, it controls the vibrations of the bridge. And the vibration, basically, we have to control uh, mainly for the pedestrian bridges and less for the... And in, in fact, there is a no... Um, uh, the uh, stipulations are given for the control of vibration of the vehicular bridges. Because in a vehicular bridge, generally, nobody perceives the vibration when the uh, vehicles are moving. But it is not the case for a pedestrian because, because everybody feels the vibrations. So that's why we have to um, uh, restrict the vibrations and that uh, is done indirectly by uh, uh, giving this particular limit on the, uh, the deflection. This is an indirect way of uh, controlling the vibrations. Then for uh, calculating the deflection of the crack member due to the sustained load, we have to take a 70% uh, of the eye gross in your model. Okay, so that gives a more or less uh, uh, correct values of the deflection. And uh, for uncracked members, such as the plistous concrete, fully plistous concrete member, under the compression, you can use a full 100% eye gross. Then when there is a uh, sustained load, uh, the creep effect should be considered for calculating the deflection. So that uh, e-value you have to modify for the this uh, the Kriff coefficient. This is a, the time when you apply the load and this is for infinity. So 1 plus 5, you have to divide to the uh, mean value of the e-value. So that reduced e-value you, uh, you have to use for calculating of a deflection for a sustained loading. And uh, because of the shrinkage, if it is a, say, for example, uh, Composite girder, uh, uh, whatever that uh, 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 stress due to shrinkage is there on the deck, uh, uh, the, uh, there will be a deformation in the entire uh, superstructure. And that curvature, this particular formula gives. And based on that curvature, you can find out the deflection of that girder. So, one small example is there, uh, solved example. Uh, just I will rush through that. There is a deck slab of a 350 mm uh, thickness with an effective depth of a 250. The cover is a uh, 50 mm and grade is a M40. The uh, SLS uh, sagging bending moment is 144 kN meter uh, for the rail combination of the load. The bifurcation of this 144 is 30% uh, uh, for the dead load and SIDL. Because being a slab, obviously the dead load uh, part will be. Uh, uh, much less compared to the uh, the live load effect, which is about a 70% of the total load. Uh, the reinforcement provided is a 20 at uh, uh, or 20 millimeter bars at a 125 millimeter center to center. Uh, so this is the uh, gross I, I value. Uh, this is uh, uh, the H if it is the gross value, and um, uh, the FCTM for a M50 grade of a concrete is a 3.5 MPA. Uh, as given in that particular table, table number 6.5. So, um, um, uh, so since the concrete is a crack, the 7 is more than, is a, almost double, uh, it is, uh, uh, the calculations are made using the crack section, ignoring the uh, tensile strength of the concrete. Uh, these are the E values of uh, steel and uh, concrete. Then, um, uh, then the E effective is again a 35 GPA. The depth of the concrete compression DC is given as a, that is the depth of the neutral axis. Basically, it's 78.02 millimeter. Uh, then, since it is a crack, then the crack moment of inertia is uh, uh, worked out, which is uh, this particular value. So, the uh, sigma top, okay, um, 
is a given uh, here, but which is at 13.98 MPa, and um, uh, for the rare combination and uh, the uh, 48 FCK, which is a 24. So 24 is a more than the 14 MPa. Whatever the section we have chosen is a uh, okay. Then the tensile st uh, stress uh, MBZ it gives a 217 MPa uh, in, uh, in the steel. Uh, and 80% of the yield strength is uh, 400 MPa, which is much more than 217. So it also satisfies that, that particular requirement of a stress in the uh, steel. Then the stress check uh, after the long-term creep effect. So um, uh, if you consider the creep effect uh, and the loading is, uh, say, after seven days with the RH value of uh, 80%, the creep coefficient from the table number 6.9 is a 2.2 and this uh, EC effective. Uh, if you consider that um, the creep only for the uh, sustained loading and not for the live load, and you know that uh, sustained loading was a, say about 22.5%, uh, not 30% as I told you last time. So uh, if you consider that weighted average for that um, uh, uh, moment, uh, you will get uh, this E effective uh, if it, uh, by the modification for the creep is a 23.41 GPA as against 35 GPA. So now you, you, if you use this particular value and work out, do the calculations again, uh, then the, this is the depth of the neutral axis, this is the eye crack. So uh, stress at the top is uh, what we now you get is a 12.05 uh, as against almost 14, 14 uh, you got it the last time. And uh, stress in the steel is a uh, 221, which is again uh, increased. Okay. Uh, then uh, the crack width calculation. This is uh, depth is uh, neutral axis is 92.17. The bar spacing is since it is the less than this. We are using this particular formula uh, for uh, SR max. Then the, uh, this is the ratio uh, for the effective areas. This is a steel area, this is the concrete, and this is, uh, with all these calculations, uh, this ratio is coming to 0 0.029. And um, the SR by max, the spacing of the maximum spacing of the uh, cracks is 287.2 uh, uh, millimeter. And this is a difference in a strain, um, uh, that is a, mainly because of strain uh, uh, tension stiffening. Uh, which is a uh, 22 uh, 221 MPa and 60% uh, of that is a 0 0.003 that is a minimum value. So we have to take minimum of these two values. Uh, uh, so the, using this particular formula, you get a 0 0.753. Uh, so the minimum of this uh, uh, value is a 0 0.663 at uh, 10 to 3. So if you multiply it with the uh, this uh, 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 the spacing of the, the cracks, uh, uh, you get is a uh, 0.22 millimeter, which is less than um, uh, 0.3 millimeter as per the code. <coughs> so, in short, uh, this is a summary. This is with the instant uh, uh, E value, and this is the long term E value. Uh, instant E value was a 35, the long term E value was a 27, uh, 23.41. I values are uh, is a reduced because of creep effect. Um, the depth of the neutral axis has gone up. The stress in the concrete has reduced, but the stress in the steel has uh, increased a little bit, and this is a crack width. Okay. So again, the, I have used the slides of the Mr. Vinay Gupta, so that's I'm just uh, making a acknowledgement. So the, the next uh, hardly 10 minutes, okay, how many uh, minutes? Maybe 15 minutes. So these again are basically a descriptive chapters, durability, the section number 14. Um, uh, basically, this is a deemed to satisfy criteria given in our code. Uh, nowadays, for a service life design of the structure, there is a lot of sophisticated methods that are available based on, a, again, the a, uh, theory of a reliability or reliability methods. Uh, um, but uh, since they are difficult to use and not much data is available, many of the codes in the uh, internationally specifies a 
deemed to satisfy rule which is the best on the experience and uh, uh, um, yeah basically the past experience so here the is 712 defines the service life as a assumed period for which a structure or part of it uh, 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 to be used for its intended purpose with anticipated maintenance but without necessary of a major repairs that is the what the expectations of a irc 112 is and depending on that particular expectation this particular uh, section has been drafted uh, so generally we uh, assume that if you uh, comply with this particular uh, stipulations given in this particular chapter how uh, the our structures will uh, achieve the service life of a uh, 100 years okay um and uh, there is a lot of difference in our earlier code that is the uh, irc 18 and 21 with respect to this code for example the blended cements like a portland pozzolana cement flax cement mineral arts admixture like a flash uh, blast uh, furnace slag silica fumes are permitted to be used which was not the case earlier the minimum cement content is lowered to 450 which earlier it was a 530 and the classification of a service environment in a four class categories that is a moderate severe very severe and extreme and depending on the what is the the chloride induced corrosion and the carbonation induced corrosion likelihood um so these provisions are against the chloride and carbonation induced corrosion of the steel in terms of adequate cover tape and impermeability concrete so these are the two uh, aims to provide a uh, adequate cover and impermeability of the concrete then the uh, uh, this uh, other mechanisms of the deterioration are through the appropriate choice of the cement mineral admixtures chemical admixtures apart from the water cement ratio the strength of the concrete is a like uh, delinked uh, from the requirement of the durability the strength is a chosen from the structural design the accepted criteria of the concrete includes the rcpt that is the rapid chloride penetration test and the um, special protection of the in form of a stainless steel reinforcement control permeability for uh, form work is uh, emphasized and then uh, this is the intent of which we have seen uh, last time the factor inf- influencing durability is the environment cover type, type and uh, quality of the constituent materials of the concrete cement content water cement ratio workmanship the compaction of the concrete as well as the curing and uh, size and uh, shape of the member then the emphasis on a permeability impermeability rather uh, one of the main characteristics of influencing the durability of the concrete and uh, uh, for the which uh, 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 prevents the ingress of the concrete oxygen carbon dioxide chloride sulfate and other delirious uh, substances degree of the permeability is a uh, governed by the constituents like a mixed proper proportions workmanship used in making the concrete a suitably low permeability can be achieved having adequately cement content low permeability etc then um, uh, these are the methods for the how the uh, this um, uh, water or gas or the chloride get transmitted uh, into the concrete and uh, these are the the parameters which influences the permeability the most imp- the important is the water cement ratio if you increase the water cement ratio the coefficient of the permeability increases so generally we have to restrict in this particular zone so that the permeability is uh, the least in this particular region uh same thing if the type of a uh, cement uh, if it is a type 1 type 2 type 5 of and uh, cement using a flash slag and a silica fume the the corrosion rate uh, is the corrosion rate microns per year uh, uh, say for example if you are using a silica fume the corrosion rate is a very less and uh, uh, if it is a say type 5 uh, cement it is a much more this is the data uh, dr malik has got it from the uh, uh, middle east dr malik was a member of this uh, committee and he has drafted this particular uh, chapter on the durability as well as the workmanship 
then the mechanism of a deterioration is the corrosion of the reinforcement for our strike act, uh, alkali aggregate reaction attack from the sulfates, from the uh, aggressive chemicals, acid attacks, ablations, and these are uh, very well explained in action B2. So this is the basically the deterioration from the uh, corrosion. There is increase of the corrosion uh, species in the porous concrete. Um, see, there is always a layer, uh, uh, the passive layer around the reinforcement due to the pH of the concrete. So that pH generally is uh, uh, approximately about 13 to 14. So because of this carbonation and the chloride, if the pH gets reduced, uh, then um, uh, that uh, corrosion process starts. And with the corrosion, that uh, product, uh, which is a... Um, uh, voluminous, it exerts the pressure on the concrete cover and it's the, the crack starts appearing uh, on the surface. Uh, uh, this is the effect of the carbonation, the atmospheric carbon, carbon dioxide converts this carbonic acid, uh, converted into the carbonic acid in presence of the moisture. And once this acid uh, goes up, the pH values go as below as a 8 and then uh, uh, it is a it gives a uh, 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 this culture for this uh, starting the uh, corrosion. So generally, the higher states of the carbonation uh, occurs when the relative humidity and atmosphere is about to 50 to 70 percent. Okay, so if you see the classification of our uh, the, uh, this one um, the uh, the, uh, the climate, uh, it is uh, if it is a uh, uh, this one. Uh, um, the humidity is more than 70%. It is uh, termed as a moderate. Let's see that one. Uh, this is a, uh, many of you may knowing this is how the carbonation has been tested. Then the interaction of the pH value and the chloride in the concrete, which I have explained to you already. And this is the, uh, the chloride um, and uh, the relation with the pH. Then the basic steps of the designing of the durability are to establish the aggressiveness of the uh, service environment, exposure conditions with respect to the various mechanisms of the deterioration. The different com component of the structures can be exposed to the different service environments. For example, if it is a box girder, the, uh, the environment within the box, inside the box, is much different than the environment outside the box. So you can have uh, two different uh, environment conditions for the one uh, structure. Then the select the type of the structure suitable for the service environment. Select the material, mix proportion, workmanship, design, and detailing, including minimum concrete or minimum uh, cover to the steel. Then th these are the various uh, factors for deciding the classification, even in the FIB. And these are the uh, exposure conditions. Uh, so the moderate, severe, very severe, exp uh, and extreme. So if you see the relative humidity is greater than uh, 70 uh, percent, uh, the, uh, this particular uh, exposure is a, uh, termed as a moderate. But if it is a between the 50 to 70, then it is a severe. So you know, now you know the, what is the reason for the uh, differentiating these two uh, criteria. Uh, so these are the, uh, the conditions. Uh, uh, or uh, explain uh, for this deciding what uh, exposure classes uh, you should consider for your design of the bridges. And depending on this uh, exposure class, uh, uh, classes, uh, your track widths are getting determined. Okay, same thing again. And uh, uh, not only the track width, but you are the dim to satisfy rule is to achieve the durability of 100 years uh, or 100 years service life, uh, the code has specified this particular uh, guidelines. So what should be the water cement ratio for various uh, uh, exposure conditions? Uh, what is the minimum cement content? What is the grade of the concrete? And um, uh, minimum cover uh, for the reinforcement. Um, then the strategy for the uh, Basically, you have to have a suitable combination of a water cement ratio and uh, cover thickness, low permeability of the concrete. Then the cover, again, the possible selection of the water, the same thing again. Uh, 
and then we have to have a uh, uh, effective diffusion uh, coefficient. So uh, this is the uh, the fixed law we use for the service life design. So as uh, the uh, this uh, depending on this uh, um, uh, the value called uh, um, uh, the this one uh, uh, D diffusion coefficient. So for the uh, five years, fifty years, and hundred years, uh, depending on the D and the chloride co concentration, uh, you have to choose the uh, appropriate cover to the reinforcement. So if the concentrations are say uh, somewhere here, then if you want to have only 5 years uh, service life, then the cover requirement is less. If it is say 100 years, the cover requirement is much more. Same thing is uh, with respect to uh, this water cement ratio. And uh, what is the effect of water cement ratio and what is the effect of a silica film on this uh, uh, diffusion coefficient. So if the water cement ratio is high, diffusion coefficient is also high. If the water, if the uh, use of a uh, or a percentage of a silica film in the concrete is more, the diffusion gets reduced. So, using all this uh, data, you can uh, design a structure for a particular service life. Um, nowadays, many structures, like a, especially the metro, the, the DMRC or the client asks to design the structure for 120 years uh, service life. So, now how to design for that 120? Because the code for this IR, IRC 112 gives a dim to satisfy rule for 100 years. Now to design for a, uh, 120, uh, so you can make a use of this uh, information. Uh, and then the, you can uh, measure the permeability using the RCPT, uh, which is the rapid uh, uh, chloride and penetration test. And uh, these are the required uh, mints of the IRC. Uh, 56 uh, days uh, RCPT values for a severe exposure conditions should be 1500 coulomb, very severe is the 1200 coulombs, and uh, for uh, extreme it is a 800 coulomb. So, what is this uh, RCPT? It is a basically a, uh, the rapid chloride penetration test. There are two uh, containments are there. One contains uh, NHEL, that is a, a salt solution with a 3% concentration. And other is the uh, NaOH, that is alkali. And then there is a uh, concrete uh, specimen and uh, um, uh, this um, uh, current is applied. And uh, so the, with the charge, how, uh, what charge is required uh, for passing the certain amount of the ions from one side to other side. So uh, if uh, the coulombs, um, if, we, if you get a 400 coulombs, then the chloride penetration, ion penetrability is very high. Okay, if it is a less, then it is a uh, negligible. So if it is an impervious concrete, then you need a, uh, this is the basically charge passed for the chloride penetration. Uh, okay, so these are the various chloride limits given in the code. The same table again for uh, uh, the durability. Actually, there is a lot of still a controversy whether uh, this crack width really um, uh, influences the durability of the structure. Many people say it doesn't uh, affect the durability. It is only for the appearance, uh, but uh, it is still not been uh, sorted out this particular debate. Then uh, other parameters like a medium cement content and a grade of the concrete. Uh, then you can reduce the cover by 5 millimeter in case of the factory made precast concrete uh, uh, elements, high performance concrete or use of a stainless steel reinforcement or control permeability form work. When uh, more than one of the above measures are adopted, a total reduction of the cover shall not be exceed 10 millimeter. What reason of a service life of 50 years or less minimum cover can be reduced to 5 millimeters. So again, these are the, um, the guidelines done by the code to um, uh, basically achieve the economy. Uh, these are the various, again, the uh, provisions for uh, uh, protect the reinforcement against the corrosion, galvanized steels, epoxy, 
बॉन्डेड स्टील सरफेस कोटिंग्स टू द कॉन्क्रीट वाटर प्रूफिंग मेम्बर एंड टू द ब्रिज डेक कंट्रोल इम्पेरबिलिटी फॉर वर्क लाइनर्स विच रिड्यूज द वॉटर सीमेंट रेशो ऑन द सर्फेस ऑफ द कॉन्क्रीट देन द कैथोडिक प्रोटेक्शन टेनलेस यूज ऑफ अस इनफोर्समेंट एटसेट्रा ओके सो सिंस देर इज अ नो कोड आई थिंक स्टिल वी डोंट हैव अ कोड यू कैन यूज दिस पर्टिकुलर ब्रिटिश स्टैंडर्ड this is that permeability uh, control permeability foam work once you apply on the foam work uh, yeah, the water goes and seep away through this uh, liner reducing the uh, water cement content of the, of the surface um, then these are the uh, uh, some examples uh, for a particular uh, project what is a chloride uh, concentration and how uh, that cover has been chosen for a life cycle of 100 years then the sulfide effect how you can choose a appropriate uh, a cement to uh, uh, take care of the sulfide effect alkali uh, silica reaction again we have to test the aggregate whether it is susceptible for that this particular reaction and uh, uh, basically eliminate that particular possibility in your structure cross attack generally it, uh, in india it can be applicable for uh, say vision called uh, in the uh, jammu kashmir himachal pradesh and so on so there again the uh, uh, minimum compression of uh, strength of 45 mpa and water uh, cement ratio should be less than uh, 0.45 uh okay there is a section on a quality control and a workmanship so uh again you can go through that uh, is a very that way descriptive these are the various cements permitted in the our code and mineral admissions uh then the good quality control as per 456 um the control of aggregate and water placing of the concrete self compacting concrete various again the provisions there was a uh, separate uh, special publication uh, irc sp 70 now it will get withdrawn and because all these provisions are now uh, uh, transported into the or uh, transferred into the our uh, new version of irc 112 this is a typical big design of a self compacting concrete then uh, the curing to temperature of the fresh concrete how to control it the means of lowering the temperature for the fresh concrete in a hot uh, weather a self test cube test other test on the concrete the acceptance criteria and again uh, this slides were prepared by let uh, malik which i have used here in this presentation so with this i am now finishing this today's presentation of a part 2 of irc 112 so thank you